In terms of brain areas that are involved in the emotional system, uh, these typically have been called like the limbic brain areas in classic kind of literature on neuroscience. Uh, so they tend to be more along the middle part of the brain, the midline organized parts of the brain. So we've talked about these before. You have critically the amygdala, this, this real kind of central hub, um, as we saw in the conditioning section that the amygdala is really important for associating stimuli with different US's, right? So different kind of associations between uh, stimuli and kind of outcomes. And, you know, a lot of those outcomes are these kind of different negative outcomes, shock, uh, uh, pain, you know, all these kinds of negative states, which then uh, drive these kinds of feelings of fear. Um, and then on the other side, positive outcomes drive this more approach-like association uh, and feelings of happiness associated with different stimuli that are associated with those kinds of outcomes. And then here's the ventral tegmental area, the dopamine uh, output area, the lateral hypothalamus that we've talked about uh, as kind of that core uh, you know, body regulation system, striatum of the basal ganglia, playing these critical roles in, uh, in modulating dopamine. So this, in fact, the nucleus accumbens is equivalent to the ventral striatum that we talked about in the PVLV diagram, if you remember, uh, that regulates dopamine firing. So all these systems are really intertwined with dopamine, the basal ganglia, uh, these positive and negative emotional states uh, really tie up with uh, that positive and negative function of dopamine and reward. And at the very highest level, you have these midline uh, ventral and medial prefrontal areas. We talked about the orbital frontal cortex before, but also critical is the anterior cingular cortex up here. So it's really all these kind of core brain areas that are important. Um, and you can see, obviously, this huge overlap in those brain areas between motivation, learning, and emotion, that's why we're talking about all these things together, because they're all at a biological level kind of completely intertwined. So there's a lot of studies of the amygdala and how the neurons there respond to different kinds of emotional states. Um, this is just one recording from uh, re uh, responses to seeing faces uh, of other monkeys and hearing sounds indicating these other expressions of different possible states. So you have threat, positive responses with coup, and negative uh, kind of scream type of, of cases. And so different tuning for these different uh, dimensions. So the amygdala overall statistically has about 80% kind of negative outcome uh, encoding and about 20% more positive. That's consistent with what we see in the number of terms associated with different emotion, basic emotions. Um, that, that generally speaking, there's more negative than positive. We're more, we have more threats than kind of, you know, that we need to differentiate and deal with than uh, kind of opportunities and positive things. There's kind of like just one of that, which is like, good, yes, go approach, do. A lot of people in the, in, in the scientific literature and even in the popular press tend to think of the amygdala as a fear only area, as a kind of negative only area but it absolutely has representations and encoding and neurons that represent positive states as well. It's just that they're kind of more in the minority. So the bottom line on this is, you know, this, this famous quote, I think I said this was Dostoevsky earlier, but it's Tolstoy, whatever, some Russian guy. Uh, <laughs> happy families are all alike and every unhappy family is unhappy in its own unique way. And so that is kind of this key point that there's a lot more negative emotions than positive emotions. And, you know, again, from the kind of metacognitive level, if you're, if you're worried that you're express, experiencing some sort of negative emotional state, you shouldn't be because that's really the dominant thing that, you know, evolutionarily in our brains are kind of wired to predominantly focus on these negative things because those are the things that are the biggest threat to our survival, right? And so everything's all about that kind of fundamental survival uh, thing. And so if, you're, if you find yourself thinking negative thoughts, having fear, having sadness, having these kind of negative states, that's actually in some sense normal because those are the things, especially that your amygdala is more predominantly tuned to. So this is a, a diagram that nicely captures kind of a much more uh, graded sense of the kind of circumplex, more intense kinds of core emotions here, ecstasy, amazement, grief, loathing, rage, you know, so it's, 
kind of organized in that positive uh, uh, negative axis, but not not directly uh, and, and more kind of high dimensional in thinking about these different kinds of aspects of, of emotion. And then you have this uh, kind of uh, intensity gradient. So that's more like the arousal dimension uh, peeling off from from each of those uh, main spokes. So it just, you know, it does have love and hate and, and all these other kinds of things that, that we think should be somewhere. Um, so uh, it's, it's a very nice, uh, you know, kind of schematic for organizing our overall emotional world. So let's talk about happiness for a moment. One thing that's really important to differentiate is, you know, these two meanings of the word happiness. And one has to do with this kind of momentary, hedonic, uh, instantaneous feeling of like, yay, okay? Um, and the other is more this kind of serenity or satisfaction, this long-term scale, like, am I satisfied with how my life is going, right? It's important to distinguish those two things. And, and in particular, there's some really interesting kind of cases where they're very out of sync. So parents having, you know, being a parent, having these experiences, I can tell you that, you know, the instantaneous day-to-day, moment-to-moment uh, experience is often very challenging and not necessarily high on that kind of more instantaneous sense of happiness. But you really do feel this kind of long-term sense of satisfaction that you're doing something important. You're raising this other human being, these other human beings, and and having this important contribution, you know? And so that's that's that sense of like self-efficacy, um, self-actualization, you're doing something important, right? Um, and that tends to be more tied up with that longer term sense of satisfaction. And so similarly, uh, people who have been in uh, very, you know, aversive uh, combat situations in the military also report kind of paradoxically that those are some of their happiest moments in their lives. And it's kind of weird to say that because obviously, you know, it's kind of scary and, and awful in many ways. Um, but on the other hand, you know, it is this high intensity situation in which you have a core group and you're all working together and survival is on the line. And, you know, it's probably not accidental that every movie has that kind of scenario in it. We're wired to really, you know, want that kind of, you know, battle kind of, uh, dynamic apparently. Um, and it, it satisfies a lot of these basic kind of emotional states. And if you look statistically across the population, there are individual differences in happiness. In general, there's a bias towards people being happy. So that's good. But on the other hand, there are certain individual people um, who basically are born unhappy. They have trait level predisposition to not being happy. Um, so there are individual differences. And in a large measure, um, you know, your kind of set point of happiness uh, does seem to have some sort of biological basis. And so, you know, there, there's lots of things that can happen to, to make you have this o- differences in overall kind of life satisfaction, but there are also these more kind of basic biological factors that also play into it. This is one of the most, you know, shocking results. It, it makes sense in terms of what we know about dopamine. Uh, the idea that, you know, somebody who uh, won the lottery is going to be actually having the same self-rated level of happiness as somebody who became a paraplegic after the initial shock or you know elation wears off so again this is one year after the onset of this new kind of condition um, people actually have no difference in in what they rate as uh, their overall level of happiness Um, and so this is reflecting the fact that that dopamine system is always recalibrating to your level of expectation. And so, yeah, instantaneously, if you become a paraplegic, you get this big dip and, and, and things are really tough for a while, but then slowly over time, you learn to adapt to your current situation and you kind of recalibrate and everything goes back to that kind of baseline level. Similarly, unfortunately, with winning the lottery or any other positive thing that happens, you get that momentary elation for some period of time, but then you know, inevitably you recalibrate to that. And maybe there's a lot of annoying things that are happening with all your friends asking you for money. And all of a sudden you're back to your baseline. So uh, it actually does make a lot of sense, this result, even though on the face of it, it seems kind of counterintuitive and surprising. And it just speaks to really the power and importance of our learning based brain. Our brain is adaptive 
the reason we're able to flourish in all kinds of different environments, we have, a, we have an incredibly adaptive brain system. It just automatically recalibrates. Uh, so we are very tough survivors, you know, uh, even if you're in, in really horrible situations, uh, your brain will help you kind of eventually adapt to those situations uh, and, and essentially make the best of it. So likewise, a lot of interest in, you know, what is the relationship between money and happiness? And as all the popular songs and everything say, money, you know, can't buy you love, it can't buy you happiness. Uh, as long as you have some minimum level of income, uh, which is culturally specific. And in this case here, we're talking more about like the United States. Um, it, it, studies show that, it, you know, above a salary of about $50,000 a year, um, any money above that doesn't buy you any further happiness. Whatever you have, you're going to recalibrate to and, and it just becomes your new normal. Below a certain level, you actually have a lot of life adversity stress dealing with basic, you know, physiological needs. Here we go back to Maslow's pyramid uh, and we say, you know, if your basic physiological needs and basic safety needs are not being met, then yeah, th those things are really going to impact you. Um, but once you deal with those very basic kind of survival needs, um, which a certain amount of money will allow you to do, then beyond that, it, it isn't really about the money. So that's really important to keep in mind. Uh, for those of you considering going to grad school or other kinds of careers uh, and thinking about what matters in life, uh, the you know pursuit of self-efficacy, again, what drives happiness overall is this long-term life satisfaction. And so if you can figure out what it is that, that is going to give you that long-term sense of life satisfaction, biologically, that's what's going to drive your overall long-term sense of happiness. And of course, all these, you know, day to day things are going to fluctuate, but that's going to be this more stable thing underlying your overall level. So in terms of things that are more strongly correlated with life happiness, uh, again, because our social forces are so strong, that social network, that ability to connect with other people, having some some real sense of belonging in your own personal world and your relationships um, is very important. That standing in the broader community, social recognition you know, essentially your, your, your rank in the social dominance hierarchy, as we'll talk about in the social chapter, um, that actually is an important factor uh, playing into these social drives, this self-efficacy, this ability to achieve your goals, again, that we were just talking about. Um, and, and so, you know, really this kind of incremental dopamine that builds up, but also I think more just like a, a sense of, of overall self-efficacy and control. And this is where we come back to that critical factor of control that pervades all of these things. If you feel like you're in control of your own life, that's, and, and, and your, your, your destiny in some sense, that is fundamentally, I guess, what we're wired to do. And it just goes right back to the, the central role of, of control and everything. Again, this 50% kind of influence of your biology, your genetic predisposition towards being happy or not. And it seems like, Again, as, as we will see as we go forward, every time we look at genetic contributions, for most things, it's about this sort of 50 percentage type contribution. And so it's no different here in happiness compared to all, all the other dimensions you might look at.